Hi everyone, welcome. You are with Scholar's Choice and we are live for our webinar. Today we are going to be talking about screens and how they affect your children and how we can really help you learn about playful learning, discovery-based learning that's really going to help you engage with your children and get them off their screens. So I know you're wondering, who am I? If you don't follow us on our social channels, I'm Emily. I'm Emily Webster. I run all of our social media. And if you don't follow us there, make sure to give us a follow. We are at Scholars Choice on Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, YouTube, and I think that's it. But I'd love for you to give us a follow and that way you can interact, interact with us all the time. And so today, I'm sure you're wondering, how did we come to this webinar? Why are we doing this? And for us, we really wanted to reach out to you guys because we had a lot, a lot of customers reach out to us at retail on Facebook. We even had a customer email in her question for this webinar this weekend. And so we wanted to do this because we received so many comments from all of you guys about how we can help your questions, your comments, your concerns. And you know, we really feel privileged that you chose to share that with us. And we really wanted to help you. And we thought this is the best way. And we're excited to speak to all of you because I think this is gonna be really good, really informational, and there's a lot to learn. There's a lot to us for us to talk to you about. And so I'm here to kind of intro the day and I'm really excited. So why we're doing this also is because we feel that children getting off screens and back to play is really crucial for their success and for them to achieve their hopes and dreams. And that's really what we believe in here at Scholars Choice is how can we help you? How can we help your children? How can we help the children in your life achieve their hopes and dreams, really learn and grow? And I think this is just going to be a really great way for you guys to feel our mission and vision and interact with us and share in this moment. So we also, just some information, we'll be doing a few polls. We'll also be doing, make sure you watch the whole way through, we'll be doing a giveaway at the end. The more you interact with us, the more we will give away. And I think it's going to be a lot of fun. We have games to give away. We have Mask Squared. This is their brand new packaging. I am absolutely in love with this. This actually just came in today. I believe it came in today. And they look beautiful. And I can't wait for you guys to go home with them. They're so much fun. Probably one of my favorite things. So I think it'll be a lot of fun. So the more you interact with us, the more we'll give away. So make sure to keep the comments rolling below. And actually, to start kind of the questions rolling, I'd love to know where everyone's from. Where are you coming from to this? Are you from Alberta? Are you from here in London? Tell us. I'd love to know. I'd love to get some chatting going with you. So I can see all your questions below. Oh, you're from Ottawa? Chantel says she's from Ottawa. Hi, Chantel. So Ottawa, have you been to our new Ottawa stores? There's train yards in Bar Haven. I think they're really great. They're absolutely beautiful. Ottawa as well. Lots of Ottawa. Newfoundland, so cool. I was actually there on a band trip when I was younger. I absolutely love the East Coast. Mississauga, I was up there this weekend, so much fun. Toronto, Toronto. Manitoba, so cool. Who else, Kitchener? I went to school in Kitchener. I went to Wilfrid Laurier. Uh, who else do we have here? We have Fort McMurray, Natalie. Thanks for joining us. Hassan, Ontario. Janice, thank you so much for joining us. I don't know specifically where that is, but I am eager to learn. I'm going to go back and Google that. Who else do we got? St. Mary's, Ontario, nice and close. Lauren from London, Ontario. Oh, I know Lauren. Hi, Lauren. Oakville, great. Hamilton. Oh, we were just up in Hamilton this week. Our manager, Dinah, actually just retired at Hamilton. So if you know Dinah and you've seen her, we're going to be posting about it later. But Dinah has now retired and we love Dinah. She was with us for 20 years and she really was a lot of the heartbeat of this business and we love her. So if you've been to Hamilton, you've met Dinah. Shout out to Dinah. Who else is that? South of North Bay is where Apostle is. Thanks, Janice. I didn't know that at all. Brampton. Oh, from Heather, we love Dinah. I'm so glad. She's lovely, isn't she? Where else? Richmond Hill. Richmond Hill's great store. Great area. Carlisle. I also don't know where that is. Greenway in Ottawa. Thanks, Deb. Brampton. Natasha, hi. Jennifer from Barrie. I actually have a cottage not too far from Barrie. Lots of fun. And the manager, Daniela, there is amazing. I love going to visit her. 
I don't know if you've been to the bakery near the store there. If you haven't, I suggest it. Woodbridge, in between Hamilton, Burlington, and Guelph. It's a lot of places. Steph from Lucan. Hi, Steph. From Janice. I work with children and families within the age group of zero to six and would love to have some information to pass on to families about healthy use of screen time. Well, you are in the right place and we can't wait to share with you all of our ideas. I think you'll really get a lot out of this. From Ajax, we have Melissa. Thanks for joining us, Melissa. I'm so excited to see so many people. Thanks so much for commenting and joining with us. This is gonna be so great, I'm so excited. Where else? Oh, we are changing, welcome. So like I said previously, if you have any questions, make sure to put them in the bottom, comment them below. We will be answering questions, our panelists all the way through. So you will be connecting with me, you'll be connecting with some of the rest of our comms team and we're more than happy to help you. And if you have a really specific question, make sure to leave it in the comments below and Julie will be answering questions at the end. So we're really excited for her to answer all your questions. I know she's excited too. And like I said, we have giveaways at the end. So definitely stay tuned for that. If you're just tuning in, we have lots of people flowing through. Oh, someone from Edmonton. We have lots of people joining in. I keep seeing all the chats pop up and I'm so excited to talk to all of you guys. But if you're just tuning in, we'll be giving away some games. And this is the one we have here with us, Mass Squared, our new packaging, very exciting. It's gonna be a lot of fun and I think you guys are gonna learn a lot. So to wrap this up, we are also going to be asking, so if our first poll is, are you attending today as a parent, an ECE, a teacher or a grandparent? So you can choose multiple if you're kind of attending as many different things, but we'd love for you to know. Good to know. Ooh, lots of votes. High amount of parents, some ECEs, grandparents, teachers as well. We're happy to have all of you. Wonderful. Lots of votes. Grandparent and EC. Very cool, Elaine. Thank you for sharing. EC trainee and grandparent Darlene. Thank you. I think you're in the right place. You're gonna learn a lot. So many different options, so many different options, so many people joining us. This could be so much fun. Thanks all for sharing with our polls. So I want to talk to you about someone who's very special to me. I've actually known Julie for over 20 years, pretty much my entire life. And she has so much knowledge to give you guys and you're really going to learn a lot from her. So a little bit about Julie. Julie is actually the vice president of sales here at Scholar's Choice. And she's also a master's candidate for her MPED, which is her master's in, in education. And she specializes in early learning. Sorry, it's a mouthful. So she specializes in early learning and she has 20 years of experience in the early learning field. She actually has opened lots of child cares for us. She also has done a lot of work and is very passionate about early years learning and children and how she can best help you achieve your child's hopes and dreams. She really exemplifies what it means to care so much about the people she works with and who she wants to reach. And I think you're really going to learn a lot for her and she's really going to have lots of amazing things to share with you. And I can't wait for you to learn more about her. And I think it's going to be great. And do we have any other questions, some more comments? Okay, so I'm actually going to go. I'm going to now go behind the camera, but Julie is about to come on and I'm excited to talk to you from the panel. You'll hear from me a bit later, but I can't wait for you guys to meet Julie and hear all the wonderful things she has to say. So I'll be signing off now. Bye. Hi, I'm Julie Belair Bach. I just wanted to start by thanking Emily for that fabulous introduction and for keeping us all going and getting excited about today's presentation. I'd love to be able to do this presentation without my glasses, but unfortunately, they go with me everywhere these days. So let's begin. Are children spending too much time on screens? So with me, I have Jen, and Jen's going to be uh, managing the uh, PowerPoint presentation with us. We're just having a little tiny bit of uh, technical difficulty here. So let's start off by talking about screen time. 
I know many of you are concerned the amount of the time that your children are spending on screens. It is a, a challenge for all of us. And, and we want to start off by telling you that we're not here to judge. I have four of my own children, but I didn't have to raise them in a time when there was such availability and accessibility to screens for many children. And that makes a huge difference. So as we go through this, and as you listen to people who are older than you or have children that are older, remember that you are in a new time. Many of the things we talk about today, the, even, the, even the research into this field is very new. And so I want you, first of all, to take a big breath and just say to yourself, I'm here to learn and that it's okay. And wherever you are in this path, we're here to support you. So Jen, let's move on to our next screen. Let's talk about what are the signs that you're, perhaps your children are um, involved in too many screens? Are they impatient? Are they bored? Are they restless? Um, perhaps are they, are they challenged with making friends? Is it all about them? You know, is their social emotional connection what it should be for their age? And are they entitled? Are they telling you, I want, therefore I should get within a very few minutes of a wait time? How much time is too much time for screens today? I think that our team is going to be polling you right now. So please chime in and tell us how much time are your children spending on screens? As I'm looking at the, uh, the toll, we have people saying that um, well, I, I have to tell you the numbers are pretty high. Um, the interesting one that is it comes in is between zero and one years of age. Uh, the recent research tells us that anywhere before 18 months, your child should have no exposure to screens. Uh, that's a tough one to hear um, because it is um, so critical in their cognitive development. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that as we, uh, as we move on. The three to five seems to be the area where we're experiencing the most amount of screen time. And that's, that could be because some of these children that we're, that we're talking about today are not necessarily in nursery or in childcare part-time, so they have more time at home and perhaps we're using screens more often. But um, I think all of us that are on the, uh, on the webinar today, uh, many of you are sharing with us that the times that your children are spending are certainly um, above what is recommended. So let's go take a look at, at what we're recommending. Sorry, I just have to move my poll. Of the way. So the recommendation for zero to 18 months is limited to video chatting. So if they have grandparents that you want to be able to engage with, again, we're talking about social, emotional development, that that is pretty much limited to what children of that age should be exposed to. Children of 18 months to 24 months, um, they should be exposed to high quality media. There's some amazing programming out there, particularly with nursery rhymes that I myself have, have watched and I think it's just great quality programming with parents watching alongside. So the child is also getting cued for appropriate behavior and also feeling that they're connected, that they're not isolated and uh, when they're watching time. Three to five-year-olds, children should be limited to one hour of high quality programming. Again, there is some amazing programming out there for children. So just take a look and you're going to find out. If you have any questions and you would like us to make some recommendations, please email us, chat with our, our panel right now and we'd be happy to share with you. Six plus, this one, um, this is a challenging one because sometimes our children are exposed to screen time at school, which is actually a part of their curriculum and required for them. But again, we really want to make sure that the screen time is limited, uh, consistent with high quality program and also not interfering with sleep time. We want to make sure that these children are off screens and enough time to calm down so that they can appropriately sleep. And also that screen times are not taking away from 
physical activity and time with friends. So this is what's so critical. So, you know, the more limited, the better, but really, you know, below two hours, one and a half would be best for children, um, you know, below six and above six, we really, uh, you need to also monitor the, the important part here for you to recognize is that it's not taking away time from physical activity and time with friends. Thanks, Jen. I want you to take a look at this screen. This screen actually talks to you about the mobile usage. So this is not televisions. This is the mobile usage, so tablets and cell phones. This is a US study. And between 2011 and 2017, look at the growth in the amount of time our children are exposed to mobile devices. I was in a grocery store the other day and a child was fussing in the line and a parent gave them a, a cell phone. Now we can all, we're gonna talk a little bit more about this example later, but I want you to think about that example. And let's talk about what we might've done in the absence of having a cell phone and how we might deal with that to again, limit screen time. What we know about screen time right now is according to the common sense media, young children in the US, and I apologize that it's US data, but that's what's available to us right now. Children under two years of age are, are on mobile devices 42 minutes per day. Children ages two to six are on 2.5 hours a day and children ages five to eight are three hours a day. So you can see already that what they're actually using are well above what are the recommended times for children to be on screens. Now, what's the problem with screens? We're gonna talk about some of the social, emotional and the absence of other cognitive development later on, but let's talk about some of the physical challenges. We're getting headaches in children, vision problems, neck and shoulder pain, perhaps eye strain, reduced attention span, because remember Netflix, every 13 seconds, the new episode comes on. Poor behavior, demanding, wanting things right away. When we are constantly entertained and we don't ever have to entertain ourselves, it's hard for us to begin to think about being creative. And also irritability, our children demanding. So Victoria Clunkley is a, a physician who's been doing research in this very area and she shares with us that in short, excess screen time appears to impair structure and function of the brain. Most of the damage occurs in the brain's frontal lobe, which undergoes massive changes from the, child, from the time a child is in puberty until mid, mid 20s or, or adulthood. The frontal lobe develops and in turn largely determines the success in so many areas of our lives. Mm -hmm the sense of well-being, our academic success, and eventually our career success. And very importantly, our relationship skills. Use this research to strengthen your resolve to reduce screen time and share it with others. Here is why, here's why we need to reduce screen time. Kids are getting what they want when they want it. Limited social interaction is causing children not to have great social skills. Fun, 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 never a dull moment. Never a no dull moment to be creative and to be thinking on your own. Technology, it's a great babysitter. I'm a grandmother of five, I understand. We just have to really take control. Delayed gratification, this is one of the things that so many young children have a very hard time coping with. And we're gonna talk about how we might deal with these things as we move forward. Why do we use them? As parents, as grandparents, as caregivers, why do we use screens? Well, it's great for transitions, pickups and drop-offs. It's great for bedtime. It's easy to use at meal prep time. I'm busy, here, have a screen, deal with that. And so these are some of the places and times that we find ourselves reverting to using screen time instead of coming up with some ideas. And we have some great ideas for you. We understand that you're tired and the screens are an easy solution. We understand that, but they really, are they really, really helping you? Or are the results causing you even more problems than you think that you're resolving? 
what skills do children do our children need to develop in order to be successful? We all need to understand we need to train our children on delayed gratification, gradually increasing the time between when they ask for something and when they get it is a skill that is going to carry them through their entire lives. Limit constant snacking, thinking about, do I really need a drink instantly? If I'm driving from a soccer game, do I have to stop at a fast food restaurant because I'm thirsty or I'm hungry? Or is it okay to wait until we get home? Part of screen time is also creating in our children a sense of urgency and immediacy that we need constantly. Make children know that it's okay to be bored. It's okay for them not to have anything to do. And as I've said already tonight, what's gonna to be created out of that boredom is going to propel them into the rest of their lives. Learn to play. Play is the work of childhood. Children learn through play. As adults, we go to work every day and we develop and we learn skills. It is through play that our children do the same. They develop cognitive skills, they develop social emotional skills, and this is what prepares them for life. And we need to allow them to play. You've heard this statement before that we need to take back play. Well, we're gonna to talk to you about the way to reduce screen time is to take back play, to give children the opportunities to play and to learn through that play. At Scholars' Choice, we have worked very hard to develop the playful learning approach. The playful learning approach is a five-step process that we have developed and it's based on a multitude of magnificent research done by many, many learned psychologists, psychiatrists, doctors, physicians. And if you'd like access to that documentation, please put in the chat and we'd be happy to send it to you. But because of tonight's short time, we're just going to go through the results. The first step, children self-direct their own play. Number two, children develop social and emotional skills through collaborative play or cooperative play. Children explore with all five senses and learn with those five senses. Children are offered play opportunities to support discovery-based experiential learning. I'm gonna explain what that one means. And children are given endless opportunities to express themselves. These five steps are how children learn. And let me go into each one now for you. Children self-direct their own play. It is so important for children when they are playing that they are able to take their play in whatever direction they choose. For example, you and I, particularly myself, I went to school and I was told what to think, how to think, and what to play. We understand now that children learn best through their own self-directed play. A blanket and some pillows become a castle. A car becomes a rocket ship. This is when children take their play and run with it. When you're playing with your child and you allow your child to self-direct their own play, you'll find that they're engaged and want to continue to play. You'll know that you're trying to be the boss when they ask you, can we please watch some screens? You know that you're on the wrong track. Children develop social emotional skills through collaborative cooperative play. Children need time to be with children. After this presentation, we're going to send you a link to a CBC documentary um, on the nature of things that was put out uh, January of just this year. It demonstrates to us that all mammals play and it is through play that we learn social skills. We learn when our friend is upset. We learn when our friend is happy. We learn that if we have a particular type of, of uh, behavior that our friends don't want to join in with us anymore. These are the social emotional cues that come to us and allow us to be develop and have friends. Children explore with all five senses. There are five doors to your brain, to my brain, and to every child's brain. And those are our senses. Our five senses are how we process information and bring it into our brains. So thinking about you know, what I see, what I hear, what I taste, 
And the, all of our five senses are used in this way. So having children have opportunities to explore with more than one sense is important for their ability to process what they're learning. We know that when we hear something, we generally retain about 5% of that information. But if we actually engage, touch, feel, explore, and actually you know, experiment, that learning becomes a part of who we are we'll retain upwards of 98% of that learning. So when children are able to touch, feel, explore, and what we call experiential play, where you're actually involved in that play, this type of play makes a difference in child's learning. Children are offered play opportunities to support discovery-based play. When we allow a child to discover something through play, it becomes a part of who that child is. For example, when you were a child and you were building blocks and someone came along and knocked them over, or because you built them so high, they fell over, you began to explore how to change your structure so that it wouldn't fall over. So perhaps you made the base bigger. These are things of discovery-based learning. We want children to discover for themselves. We don't want to tell them. When you tell a child something, you steal from them the opportunity to discover it for themselves and therefore for that learning to become a part of who they are. It is so important for children to be able to discover themselves while they play. The fifth and final step, children are given endless opportunities to express themselves. Expression for children is found in many ways. We can talk about verbal expression, but remember, the way I play, the way I might dress up in a costume, the way I might dress myself in the morning, these are all ways of expression. It is so important for children to feel that what they feel and what they say is important to you. When children feel engaged with their parents or their teachers, they want to be a part of it. They're not trying to seek out screens to be able to escape what's happening. They want to be engaged. Please listen to your children. It doesn't matter if what they have to say is, is poorly spoken. Tell them that you enjoy what they have to say and what they have to say is important to you. You'll begin to see that their vocabulary will grow, that they'll develop and they'll want to speak to you. Allowing children to express themselves is so important. It allows them to feel that they are valuable. These are the five steps that we believe at Scholar's Choice are how children learn. We believe that it's through these steps that children will grow and develop and achieve their hopes and dreams. So let's see what this actually looks like in action. This screen shows you the playful learning approach. These are a series of pictures. I work a lot with child cares, as you might see by the pictures. But I want you to notice that in these environments, the toys are out, readily accessible for children to self-select. They are being creative. They are outside. They are messy play. Again, reinforcing the, the five senses. There are opportunities for children to express themselves. And there are children who are cooperatively playing, learning social emotional skills. This is what play looks like to a child. And I want you to think about this is what work likes, looks like to a child because play is the work of the child. Now, what do I do? I've got all of this information. I know that I have my child having too many screen, too many hours of screens. And I've just been exposed to five ways that child learns. So now what do I do with this? Boredom is the first step of creativity. I know it's not going to be easy, but you have to start. Surprise your children with a new board game. Play some music and dance. While dinner is being prepared and you're not gonna turn the screens on, turn on some music. Show them just how groovy you really are and they are going to have memories to last them a lifetime. You know, when you're a grandparent and you go to your children's home and you see them dancing with your children, you know you did something right. Turn on the music and have some fun. Go outside, explore outside. I know it's cold outside, but bundle up. We live in Canada and let's celebrate outside. 
build a snowman, build a snow fort, crawl inside, engage in risky play, jump off of a snowbank. What children need is their heart to go thump, 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 thump. That's what makes us excited in life. And children need this from you. If what they have to play with is not very exciting, they are going to want to watch screens. Make outside fun. Go for walks. Take the dog. Have a race with the dog. Have a race with your mom. Race with your children. Run around the parking, the, the parking lot if that's all you have. But have fun and get outside. In the summertime, catch frogs. Go down to the pond. Let them wade through the water. It's going to be okay. Take a moment, all of us. Indulge with me. I would like all of you to just close your eyes for a moment. And I want to take you back to your fondest memory of childhood. Think about a time that you were full of joy. Now come back to me and open your eyes. My prediction is that almost all of us, that memory is outside. We remember the joy of the sun on our necks. We remember the water on our toes. This is what childhood is about. I challenge you to remember the joy of your own childhood and bring it back to your children. This is what we need for our children. This is what is going to reduce the amount of screen time. We, are, um, we have a great link for 101 super ideas that you can do with your children. So please chime in in the chat and we'd be happy to send that to you. Children change when parents change. I know that that's a startling statement for me to make, but it is a very true statement. Play with your children. First and foremost, get down on the floor, crawl on your hands and knees. Children want you to be with them. They're little, they're not big. If you're six feet tall, you just can't be six feet in play. Unless of course you're the monster in that play or the great big giant. Get down on the floor, look at your child in their eyes and let them lead the play. They'll take you into magical worlds and wonderful places if you only let them. Remember that the dolls become knights, that their cars become robots, and the my greatest memories are building forts. I was one of seven children and we had great fun building forts and crawling inside them. I have four of my own children and we had many, many fun times crawling inside of forts. Build a fort for your children and crawl inside. Watch again the wonder in their eyes as you become a part of their world and engage with them. Visit us at Scholar's Choice. Let us help you. Call us, reach out to us on Instagram or Facebook, follow us. You met Emily. She posts the most magnificent ideas for play for you. I know that there's only one of me sitting here, but there are 200 people behind me who support this very notion of play and taking back play and that we are devoted and dedicated to your children achieving their hopes and dreams. And we know this happens through play. Take back play, take back childhood. The one thing that your children need from you more than anything, parents' attention is the child's most neatest, needed nurturement. I know I said that terribly and it is so important. I'm going to say it again. Parents' attention is the greatest nourishment that any child needs. Get down on the floor and play with children. You will make a difference and you will reduce the amount of screen time that's happening in your home. Thank you very much for, for joining me. I, um, I have some time now to be able to take questions and uh, I'm, I'm really excited to be able to talk to you about your very questions that you have. And uh, you know, when I see children play, it is wondrous, the magic that happens. And remembering that not only do your children need to play with you, but they do need to play with other children. So, you know, play dates that aren't about being inside watching television, but play dates are about creating opportunities. Set out toys for your children. Follow Emily on Instagram. She has the most magnificent ideas where we set out what we call learning opportunities or provocations 
but really what they are is just setting up some good old fashioned fun and inviting children over to participate. All right, so I'm Emily, I'm back. If you were with us earlier, I have a whole bunch of questions that have been pouring in this entire time that we're gonna take the time to answer. So from Janice, Janice would like to know, what is your viewpoint on the use of iPads within the classroom? Well, um, as, you, as you know, my specialization is in early years, so really birth to eight. And that um, I think that there are great opportunities for technology in the classroom. I do believe it needs to be hands-on. I'm not a big proponent of uh, iPads in any type of nursery environment or childcare environment, so before four or five. I think that we have some great technology, little robots that children can can program, run through mazes, create worlds for these little uh, robots to, to run through. I think that it's great to, to expose children to pre-coding or actually coding. I think that these are fabulous ways to, to introduce science and technology. Uh, we're gonna be posting a video of some training I did just, uh, I guess it was last week, on uh, STEAM in the uh, early years. And so um, I hope that, that, that this helps and take a look at it. But I think that um, iPads in the classroom, um, my biggest concern is that it's taking away the time for all of the other types of play that could be happening for children. Okay, so we have a question in the chat from Andrea. And Andrea would like to know, what ideas do you have for tweens who don't wanna play with boys anymore? That's a really good one. I think that's what we talked about about expression. Working with those children on expressing themselves. Perhaps maybe work with them on their writing skills or dressing up. Spend some time and say, let's discover your style. Let's try on some different clothes. Let's try them on different ways. Let's express ourselves and find opportunities for them to do that. Also, go outside. Find activities that that tween is engaged with. Perhaps she likes horseback riding. Perhaps she's in love with the dogs and would like to do some dog training. It's really about finding the love for that child, what they're passionate about, and then channeling your energy to that child. Great, great answers. So we actually got a question emailed into us and I really wanna make sure we get to her. So Melissa asked, she said, my question is about what to do after you've already lost control of screen time. Our son is seven years old and we've already opened Pandora's box, so to speak. He has his tablet, computer time, Xbox, all these things. How do we turn back time and go back to an acceptable amount of screen time, maybe including TV? He's addicted. He maybe has an explosive reaction when he doesn't have access to it and he hasn't feel confident when things don't work out quick enough. So what kind of advice would you give Melissa? Well, Melissa, I think that, that we, we addressed part of your question in the very presentation when we talked about, is your child impatient, bored, restless, entitled? I, I think that's what you were describing. So what we know is, is that first and foremost, you need to change, Melissa. You need to change how you act with your son. If you have a phone, you need to put it away. You need to turn it off and you need to put it in the cupboard and you need to get down and you need to play with him. And at first he is going to push back. He is going to want screen time. But if you continue to play with him and introduce ideas, bring out some blocks, bring out some construction toys, start to build yourself, see if you'll come over and play. Once he takes over the play, go with him. Don't continue to lead, but you can start off by giving him ideas of play. Your son perhaps has lost what it is to be creative and to explore his own imagination because that takes downtime and boring time. But that's what we want for him. I understand it's not going to be easy, but first and foremost, you need to change and you need to start to play. Take him outside, expose him, to the outdoors. Why I emphasize the outdoors so much is because it is definitely physically away from screens. Please don't bring your phone with you. That would totally be the wrong approach. But go outside, Melissa, and spend time with your son. It is much easier to have fun outside because there's no screen staring at you. So Melissa, I hope I've answered your question, but if you want more detailed information, you know, email us. Uh, we have a 1-800 number and I'd be happy to talk to you more about this. 
We have a question from Tanya. She says, how can an RECE help families manage screen time? That's a great question. I deal with that a lot. As you know, I, I train across the country um, in many, many early years centers. And we often talk about how do we help parents and as an ECE, as you know, you know, perhaps programs like HighScope, where we are actually working with parents, do give us um, an ability to, to, to have that platform with them. But really, it's about perhaps talking to them about playing. How do you play? Perhaps share with them the five playful learning approach that I shared with you today from Scholar's Choice. We need to teach parents how to play so that they may in turn play. And what we really need to do is remind them the joy of their own childhood, a time when things were simple and play was easy, and tell them that's what they need to go back to. It's not easy for any of us, and it always starts with sitting on the floor. Catherine has a great question. She said, you mentioned the child in the grocery line. She says, what would you have done in that situation? Well, as I mentioned to you before, I had four children. So I used to take four children to the grocery store. My children were close in age and we all went. We used to do, this was my idea. I used to play I Spy. So we would say, I know that this is a challenging time. I know that waiting in this line is hard for you and it's hard for me too. So what can we do? So let's see if we can find things that are purple and we would all be able to participate. Let's think, what can we find that is green? What can we find that is red? And hopefully the line moves faster than we could possibly imagine. But if not, think about other games that you might be able to play. You're with four children in a grocery store. You wanna hear me sing? Well, just stand behind me because I can sing with the best of them and I'm not very good. But this is about moving my children through the transition zone. So if we needed to sing a song, if we needed to do actions, if we needed to sing Wheels on the Bus, then that's what we did. These are ideas. People who stare at us and around us, we have to learn to let it go. But let's be examples to other parents that we don't have to give screens away. Sing, play games. That's how I manage the line. This is a really interesting take on this entire webinar and it's a really great question I think. So an anonymous attendee asks, is there such thing as not enough screen time? My daughter is 11 and I only let her use her tablet for schoolwork or school projects which is maybe only an hour a week. Her daughter says she's not being fair. Should she use it more? I think that's a great question. Anonymous, I think you're doing a bang up job. If your daughter wants to be able to use screen time for high quality viewing and high quality programming, I think that perhaps maybe the two of you could explore that option together. But limiting her screen time and making sure that she has opportunities to really be able to fully participate in the playful learning approach. Even 11 year old children play. It is so important that you give her that time. And I'm sure that your child has many creative uh, outlets that she has that many children who are 11 or her friends don't have because she has the time to explore those options. But once again, as she gets older, there will be more pressure for you. But sit down with her and together decide on what would be proper use of her screen time. This is a really good question from Monica. Monica asks, with play-based learning being the center of kindergarten curriculum, what suggestions do you have for keeping children engaged in play at home? Well, I think that I'll refer to it again. The playful learning approach really helps guide you. Make sure that your play at home is sensory based, that children can explore with all five senses. So perhaps Melissa, was it Melissa, this girl's name? Monica. Monica. Sorry, Monica. Here's one that I just did recently. I brought in a tray of snow and we brought it inside the house. Not a ton of snow, but enough that they could make snowballs. We brought in some paint so they could color the snow. When you're at home with children, think about what it is that you would like to to set up for them an opportunity for them to create a learning environment and then invite them. Put tape on the floor different lengths of tape on the floor and then give them blocks and say, I wonder how many blocks it would take for us to fill up this length of tape. 
it's not about measurement in inches. It's about being able to understand that measurement is really about whatever tool it is. It can be how many of this pen long a line is. Thinking about what it is that you could create at home that allows the child to explore and discover learning. If you follow us on Instagram and Facebook, we constantly are posting great ideas for you to use. So follow us. And uh, again, if you have more questions, just shoot us a, a personal email and we'd be happy to send you links to all kinds of great ideas to really engage your children in play at home. All right, from Janice, if a child is already showing signs of ejection, a parent is unsure on what to do because the child is displaying aggression to the parent. What or where can a parent go to access some strategies on what to do? Well, I think that first of all, if you feel that the aggression is serious, I would first consult uh, the child's pediatrician or family doctor. I think that's always a great place to start whenever we see behavior that we're concerned with. Second of all, I really think that taking away the screens and making sure that they're not accessible and not easy to find for the child will be your next step. My son um, actually removed screens totally from his house recently, and he's really noticed a great difference in his children. It was hard. It certainly is not easy, but the rewards are huge. Children will play. I promise you, they will play. It is innate in them. Watch that video that we're going to send to you from CBC about play. It is born in who we are that we will play. And we will, if given the opportunity. Remember, children need multiple things to play with. They need to be able to have dress up materials. They need construction materials. They need a home corner so that they can play out and role play being an adult. There are many centers that are required for children to really explore play. And come on out and visit us and let us help you. You don't have to have them all tomorrow, but you can slowly grow and develop what is really needed for your children. And actually, we're even talking about in the future doing some great giveaways on playroom activities and playroom toys and actually setting up a playroom for a family. So keep, keep contact with us. This is just the beginning of us teaching you how to play with your children. Wonderful. So we got another question from Catherine. What do you think of forest-based schools? Oh, last year um, in July, I um, had the great privilege of going to Scotland and we went to Glasgow and we were exposed to um, some amazing nurseries. Um, I think forest-based schools are fabulous. Children are connected with the environment just by their very nature. And when children have opportunities to explore and really what forest-based schools really do is allow children risky play. There's some great videos out online taking a look at um, some of the schools in Denmark would be phenomenal for you to take a look at and then watch them and see what you could do for your children. You could take them out to the bluffs near a lake and let them stand up on a 30 foot high bluff and look over. They're fine. They're not going to fall. Let them be excited and thrilled. This is what forest-based schools do. Take your child on their bicycle and let them go down a hill. That's reasonable. Let them feel the wind in their hair. Children need to explore and be excited by life. This is what forest-based schools allow children to do. They climb trees. They jump from trees. You can create all of that, own, your, that environment for your own children in your own backyard or the local park. If you have a chance, though, to explore a, 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 even a camp this summer for forest-based schools, it is amazing the, the bravery that your children will discover in themselves and um, what explorers they truly are. Wonderful. So we have a question from Aaron. Aaron, I'm sorry if I'm butchering your name, but great question. When given opportunity for free play, children I work with automatically go to the current superheroes, like for an example, Black Panther, Venom, Spider-Man, active running, including roughhousing. Any suggestions? So I think that perhaps we're talking about a nursery that she's in at childcare. So 
I think that what I like to do is set up provocations. For those of you who don't understand what those might be, they're learning opportunities. And I set up many in a room so that when children come into the classroom, they're drawn to activities that I have set up that they can explore. Might be literacy based, might be math based. I might have a light table set up with a provocation that they can move forward with. I might have an idea how it starts, but I find that when I don't set up anything, the children do an awful lot of rough play, pushing, shoving, and running. I call it the speedway around my classroom. So what you need to do is have opportunities for children to go to things. Also, I limit the costumes. I really like costumes that are uh, just large scarves that children can create so many different things with. And I also use those scarves to cover up different things so that children, you know, the, the schema of um, enveloping and that they want to go over and open it up and discover what it is that I may have inside. When your classroom is full of exploration and wonder, this is what the children will want to participate in. I'd be happy to talk to you one-on-one -on -one about more ideas and send you pictures of lots of provocations that I have set up. But it really is the key to keeping children focused is having multiple provocations set up throughout your classroom. So Rachel is wondering, what are some of your favorite toys for children? Well, that's really hard for me because I believe wholeheartedly that children need many, many toys, but I do love loose parts. I love toys that can be anything, that they are construction, but they could build a house, they could be a person. I love toys that are open-ended, toys that allow children to take them and become anything that their imagination, discovery-based learning. So um, those would be my most favorite toys. But then as children become older, I love games and puzzles. These are great opportunities for children to develop their cognitive skills and really move along their learning process. So we also have another anonymous question. We have, I let my kids play together independently and they always play well together until they start fighting. It's ongoing, always the referee. And I really end up giving them screen time just so they'll stop fighting. <sighs> As I mentioned, I had four children, understand completely. I think that when you have children of varying ages, which happens in a home, we understand that children play from beginning at isolated play through parallel play to cooperative play. And when we put children of different ages together, it can be a challenge. This is why school is structured the way they are, the way it is, and so are nurseries. So in our own home, when play begins to get a little bit louder, one of the ideas might be to suggest that one of your children or two of the children participate in a game or a puzzle. Start it out, set it out on the table, begin to put it together yourself. Children will come over and start to play with you. Then move on to something else and set something else up for perhaps a younger child or even the older child that might interest them. Play at the beginning is always good, and I get it. But then as that goes, you need a few tricks in your pocket. And as I said, a puzzle is a great one. And thinking about what you might set up for those children that once the play gets to be um, a, a little bit crazy. All right, let's see. We also have any ideas on how to increase vocabulary within young children and make it fun? Absolutely. Talk to them. Talk to them, talk to them, talk to them, and never stop talking to them. And I don't mean ask them 100 questions. Nobody wants that game. But talk to your children. And when they don't talk very much, celebrate every word they say. Another great strategy is to use dramatic play. So dramatic play allows children to express themselves in short words. So pretend to be at a restaurant, pretend to be getting gasoline at a gas station and allow the children to use the words they have. While a child is learning language, don't ever talk down to them. Use all of the words, the adult words that you know. If children can say Tyrannosaurus Rex, they can say anything. Their comprehension isn't the issue. It's their confidence in being able to speak. The more you speak, the more the child will be able to move forward in language. 
Children all don't move forward in language at the same time. They might be working on another part of their cognitive development that is moving faster than lightning. And that language might be one of the ones that they're, they're, they're not moving forward with as fast, but it will come. The important thing is to continue to reinforce language constantly, giving your child the opportunity to express themselves. And when they use a word that isn't exactly perfect, don't correct them and make them feel that it was a poor attempt. Celebrate every attempt. And also, if it does go beyond a certain age, make sure that you talk to your family doctor. They're going to give you amazing insight into whether or not that the child is actually delayed or whether or not sometimes as parents, we expect a little much from our children. All right, so great question from Darlene. Any ideas for children who like to play with weapons or like seem to like make believe weapons? The, the child who takes even the zucchini and makes a gun. I think that um, that can happen. That happened to me in a grocery store. My son picks up a zucchini and starts to shoot the lady in the next aisle over. And I think, oh my goodness, I am a horrible parent. What the heck happened here? But I think that children see things and children will mirror what they've seen. And perhaps I was the one who showed them something inappropriate um, on a movie or exposed them to something that I wasn't even aware of. And this happens. We just need to move on. We need to be able to redirect play. We need to tell children that is really that that type of play is really not the best play for where we are, or that it would make our friends feel bad if we pointed a gun at them and that we made those noises. So how about let's put that down and again, redirect them. You need to have other things that interest your child available to you. And it's certainly not just turn on the screen to stop them from playing that. Perhaps children like Lego or blocks or puzzles or games, or craft materials. That's a great one for children. Put out crayons, put out glue, put out sparkles and sprinkles and glitter. Everyone wants to come and play when you open up the treasure chest of craft. Wonderful. So I have another anonymous question. I work from home and need to be on my laptop regularly. How can I keep working on my laptop while engaging with my child? Unfortunately, I need to work while my three-year-old is home with me. Well, that's a challenge. It is very, very hard. My suggestion would be that you try and set up provocations that I talked about that may engage your child, and you're going to need to set up multiple ones. Not one or two, but if you're going to have to be working on your computer for a while, you might need to think about six or eight that are set up around the house from room to room that you can move your child from. Also, however, it might seem like a lot, but a second child would, bringing another child in would also help your child to be busy, to be, have someone to play with because children need you to engage with them. Children really aren't at three years old capable of independent play. So setting up the provocations, I think would be the best step for you and then thinking about perhaps maybe inviting over a, a young girl you know who's in grade six or seven uh, who might come over and and play with your child these might be some great options for you to think about and try and gear your work to the times that they are available to play with your child all right there's so many good questions um let me see this one is interesting. Being outdoors seems to provoke my husband's anxiety, or my spouse's anxiety, rather. For example, the kids getting dirty, damaging their clothes, catching a cold, all the things that come with outdoor play. Well, here's the only thing I can really promise you, that being outside, you never caught a cold from being cold. Uh, you catch a cold from a virus, so... Um, I think that that would be, uh, perhaps maybe you could find some links on and share that with your, um, your husband on how children catch a cold. Here's what I think. Buy yourself a one-piece outdoor plastic suit and put it on top of your children's clothes and let them get filthy. Just absolutely filthy. Let them slide in the mud. Let them wear it as a cape. I think the dirtier children get the better. And Maybe I'm not the one you want to hear from. But if you buy these one-piece suits, and not to be, you know, plugging up. We do carry them because we believe in them. And then just zip it off and throw it into the wash. And their clothes are clean underneath. 
this is one way of helping when a parent has anxiety over children being dirty. But what I'm going to tell you is, is that when children are exploring, they're not going to stay clean. Wonderful. We also have, what toys do you recommend for a three and a half year old child who displays the schema play of rotation? Oh, wow. Love it. Love it. And they're going to continue until they've mastered it. And then they're going to go on to the next schema. But we have some great toys from Fat Grain Toys. And there are these discs and they spin and they also stack. So could one of our panelists just look up the code for that? and send that to that question. Also, we have these great uh, squigs that, that stick together, but then also could spin with rotation. Um, we have uh, uh, the bimbo chair, bimbo chair, how do I say that? Bumble, Bumble chair uh, that you could use. And so let's just send that question off to the panelists. And if it's not enough, let us know. And, and I'll personally look up a whole host of products, but we have some great, toys for that schema. And remember that all children go through schemas. Schemas is just another way of learning. It is how we learn. And so, you know, some children are going through the schema of throwing. Just make sure that the things that they're throwing are not going to hurt anyone or damage the house, but let them throw. Children will need to move through these schemas in order to be able to have mastery. This is how we achieve mastery as a child. And frankly, it's not any different than some of us as adults. As we learn things in work, we develop schemas for how we, how we manage things. And so schemas are a way of, of us learning things and how we process. It's how we learn. A schema is how we learn. Sorry if I didn't say that. Sorry. A schema is how we learn. A learning process that we've developed. Wonderful. So next question, when in a early on program, there's a parent who's always on their phone. If you're a facilitator there, what do you say to the parent? I think you ask them. Well, you know what I think would be the best? Actually, let me take that back. I would set out a rule for the entire group that it is a zone. It is a um, technology free zone. And that before we started, we could ask for everyone to please put their phone away because we all want to be respectful of each other and give all our attention to each other and to most importantly to the children. I think that by setting out guidelines to start with, instead of singling out one single person is the best way to approach these situations. Wonderful. So we also have um, around, let me see. Sorry for the delay here, everyone. Oh, that's great, Em. You're awesome. I am interested in learning more about exploration provocations to use during literature story hour from Elaine. Well, Elaine, so, so what Elaine, I think, is asking us is that um, when we share a book with children um, and we, let's say the book is on stone soup, and uh, then what we can do is we can set up using a small world tray or a bucket or a table, we can set up what, what the story shared with us by using different things in our classroom and gathering those together to actually allow the child to immerse themselves into that literacy play by experiencing what they saw in the book. So let's say it's Billy Goat Gruff. I might have a bridge I built. I may have the Billy Goats underneath. I might have someone who's tromping along the top of the bridge. Um, I might even just play that out in, in with the large blocks in the block area play. But it's about taking literacy and moving it into a realm where children can experience it firsthand. Wonderful. And if you are interested in seeing particularly the tray that Julie's talking about, actually, we posted about it on our Instagram on... I want to say Thursday. So definitely check that out. There's three story-based tough trays that are amazing and they look so good. We have another great question. Let me see. Do you have tips to discuss the issue of too much screen time with other caregivers in brackets, grandma? <laughs> um, I know that Sharon talking with family sometimes can be very sensitive. And I think that, um, you know, so as, as I was saying to that, uh, that caregiver who was talking before about the whole group is setting out a set of rules by which um, it is best to spend time with your children. So saying that, you know, we really want to limit time, perhaps even saying that what we'd really love for you to do is to just turn off the television and spend some time in play, perhaps bring toys with you 
to the grandparent we were talking about, right? Because they just might not have the toys that will allow them to, to participate in discovery-based play or self-directed play. And so bringing those toys, and perhaps you could model that behavior for them, and then they might be able to do the same. Sometimes as grandparents, we're distanced from raising children. And by you demonstrating and modeling the behavior that you would like to have them have, um, that might be the most gentle way to coax them uh, away from screens and into what we would consider to be the best practices for, uh, for working with your child. Barring that that works, you may have to, um, you know, uh, set down some rules for uh, screen time. And I think that's reasonable. Um, I have adult children who have children and, you know, I, I tell my grandchildren, I'm, I'm your nanny and, uh, but mommy and daddy are your boss. So uh, we have to always listen to what mommy and daddy say. And we have to make sure that we follow through on that. And children quickly understand that, you know, my role as their grandparent is to love them, but to always first and foremost respect um, their parents' wishes. Great. So another anonymous question, do you feel that there is a place for roughhousing in terms of understanding conflict? Often imaginary play leads to this in young children, especially males. Well, I certainly do. I certainly believe that there is a place for roughhousing. I think that um, uh, particularly with little boys, we see it. And uh, it's not that we would encourage it, but I don't always want to be disciplining it especially when it hasn't gone too far. There's a shove, there's a push. We can quickly move children on to, um, um, to other play. And if you watch, again, we mentioned it a number of times tonight and, and Scott actually just shared with me the CBC video. If you watch that video about play, you're gonna see how young mammals roughhouse and play and, and discovering um, about themselves, about their limitations. And so you're really gonna see through that, that there is a place for roughhousing. And, and just in my own research and in my own studies, um, I do think that sometimes we're just a little bit too quick to end play. It's not dangerous. No one's getting hurt. And, uh, you know, sometimes uh, there is a place for it in play. Wonderful. Lisa asks, as a family child care provider, I use my phone and an app to update parents to let them know what's happening with their children and post pictures. However, the kids see me being on my phone and want to mirror that behavior with screen time. Any tips? Oh, that's a hard one. That's really hard. Um, I think that we have to share with them what we're doing with it and that at no time is it used for, you know, you to pick up the phone or to talk to people or to distract you from caring for them. So I think if you talk to children, they are very capable of understanding the difference between you being on your phone so that I'm sending mommy pictures, daddy wants pictures, nanny wants pictures, grandma wants pictures. That is one way of sharing with the child. There's a whole nother thing if you're sitting there watching you know, YouTube videos and then telling the children no. So bring them in, let them see what it is that you're using the phone for. We're using the phone so we can share time that are happening between you and your friends with your parents. And I think that children are more than capable at a very young age to understand. Wonderful. So I'm going to combine two questions together because I kind of feel they fit together. So I have school age children seem to only want to discuss their violent video games, any suggestions on how to redirect and focus or inspire them, but also what about children who use inappropriate language for a reaction? Well, wow. Um, this is just a reality. Uh, children have learned that uh, using that type of language has gotten a shock or a reaction and they're quick to use it again. I think that by, you know, being calm, not having a reaction to the words, but telling them that in this space, when we're friends and we respect each other, we limit the language that we use to be kind words and only kind words. And that within our classroom, we only speak to each other as friends. And would we ever talk to a friend in a mean or disparaging or unfriendly way? This is how I manage this. At a very young age, sometimes the things that children share with me or tell me or words they use, shock the bejeebers out of me. 
but this is not the reaction to have. The reaction is to let the word pass. And as I said, to very much share with children that this, where we are, is is a safe environment and that we are friends and loving friends and we only use loving kind words here. And this is what I have found does limit um, the use of these words. Some children are challenged and continue to use them and I continue every day to share the same. Okay, so our last question is an anonymous one. Hi, I have a nine-year-old autistic son who's very attached to his iPad, and it's always a struggle to take him away from it, especially at night. Any helpful tips or suggestions? I think that is very, very hard when they are older and they are, they are attached to their iPad. I think it's very hard to be able to get them to bed, so you really need to start making that transition much earlier, warning them ahead of time, letting them know that, you know, we've got 15 minutes, we've got 10 minutes, we've got five minutes to, to screens out. Every child is able to understand um, that we have set rules, that we have um, ways in which we conduct ourselves in our home or in our classroom and that there are ways and rules that we all respect. And I think that um, I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but it is going to be about you filling the void between needing that screen time because he's getting a lot of instant gratification. Let's be honest, that's what's happening, right? And, and being able to work with him. So thinking about things that he might enjoy, perhaps he might enjoy um, working with blocks or he might enjoy story time with you or he might enjoy music being played um, he might be enjoying that lap that ipad because of the sound stimulation you know depending what it is that he's getting from that then think about how i might introduce that in another way other than screen time that would be my best tip off the top of my head i'm not saying it's going to work and if it's not effective please email us and i'd be happy to go further into that with you so so is that our we have some we have a last poll that we want to share with you guys so we would love to know if you found this effective if, did you find it informative did you enjoy engaging with us let us know we'd love to talk more to you in the future so if you guys could give that an answer but also, I want to say, on behalf of all of us here, you can't see me anymore, but I'm still here, a huge, huge, huge thank you to for joining us for our very first webinar. This is going to be a new series that we're going to be doing monthly featuring Julie and some of our other friends in the office. And, you know, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. And I really appreciate that you came out, took the time to engage with us. I hope that you got great answers to all your questions. And if you still have questions, you're more than free to reach out to us. You can email us, you can call our 1-800 number. We also are active on Facebook Messenger. So feel free to shoot us a message wherever. And we're more than happy to engage with you at any time. And we're really here for you. And we really do want to help you. And what can we do to help you achieve your hopes and dreams and your children and you can also go reach out to our retail teams they have a lot of great suggestions as well for items that they can give you and i think it's just been a really great session and thanks so much for joining us so i also want to let you know anyone who asked a question tonight you are a winner you have won a game and we will be contacting you with all of your winner information so that is very exciting congratulations thanks yes. everyone for joining us and do we have any other closing remarks, Julie? Yes, I just wanted to say what a privilege was to be able to have the opportunity to talk with you, to be able to engage with you up on one of the most important topics that, that exist, which are our children, and to let you know that at Scholar's Choice, we value, we are dedicated, and we are committed to ensuring that your children achieve their hopes and dreams, and that at the end of all of this, we are here for you. Thank you so very much. And thank you again for the privilege of being able to join you this evening. Bye-bye.